Hi ho. So I am back from New Zealand and I thought I would carry on with the 11.23. The, as I said in the last video I was trying to find replacement capacitors for the one that blew up, which I still have, and the US prices for them seemed a bit horrific so a friend suggested that I try JCAR which is a company in Australia and New Zealand and so I picked up some replacement line caps, that's these two yellow blocks here. And unlike the six dollars almost that they were in the US, I paid a buck fifty for them. So it's kind of easy math there and since I was going down under anyway. So we have everything back together again. Uh, something that I found handy, um, you know, like most geeks, I take things apart and they sit apart for a while and I get back to them and if I'm lucky I can remember how to put them back together again. I have worked on, well, actually, it's right here. My Dell Latitude laptop, which is, um, well, quite frankly, older than both of my children. And it was, I think, the second laptop I owned. It was a work laptop, and I received three of them. One from my boss, one from a cousin, and one from eBay. And all of them had a problem, and I took them all to pieces, and I put them all back together again, and I had one good one. You know, and you have hundreds of little pieces when you take something like this apart. But when I did that, I did it all in the space of a Saturday. So I had it all blown out across my dining room table and putting things back together and it was easy because it was fresh. And, you know, maybe it's just me, uh, the fact that I have a memory of a sieve. But when I do things like this and then I walk away, I have real troubles remembering how to put things back together again. So I've started making myself a map. And I appreciate that this looks like either chicken feed or doctor's writing, but uh, I've made myself a order of what has to be put together in which order to make sure that I don't forget what the hell I'm doing. Uh, so I've got a brown wire and a blue wire and both of those connected to this little daughter board here and so I had to make sure that I got those around the right way. And then I had to make sure to hook the uh, grounding strap, which is down there, back up and the uh, second cable that goes to the connector here and the fan and all of that crap and it's minor minor stuff but um, when you plug it back in together and you haven't done it right eh, your day's gonna get a whole lot worse um, you know even worse than ducks quacking when uh, caps explode because if you miss something really important something really bad could happen so uh, maybe we should put it back together again and give it a whirl. So I should mention that I've actually powered this up already. Uh, primarily because I wanted to make sure that I hadn't seriously screwed it up. And uh, all is copacetic, thankfully. Sort of. So, I had uh, made that classic mistake of getting ahead of myself. And I had put the power supply in, reconnected everything, rerouted all of the cables, and um, oh, of course it comes back out. There it goes. And uh, put all the covers back on. And as I was putting the covers back on, I knew I was doing the wrong thing. You know, you have those moments where you go, "This, I." I I'm placing a level of confidence in myself which Murphy states will not be rewarded well. Let me pick the camera up. And uh, I was, as expected, rewarded with things not working well. Uh, what happened was when I plugged everything back together again and fired it up, the um, disc controller suddenly vanished. And I was most distressed. Uh, and then, of course, I did what everybody does. I took the whole damn thing back apart again. Curse my own stupidity. Yes, I've got that on right. And tore the machine uh, apart, card by card, cable by cable. And lo, the universe was happy again. After everything had been reseated, my disc controller magically came back. So I'm not quite sure where it went. But... It's alive now.
Come on, you bastard. There it goes. Never forget to talk to them. That makes all the difference. I apologize for the cutaway. I didn't cheat. What I did do is knock over one of the covers, the one that goes here actually, and sent all of the screws flying across the floor and there were language involved that I really didn't think needed to be on eBay. Um, although, do me a favor and have a look at your feet and if you find any screws with a nice lock washer on it, send it my way. It'll be bollocked uh, I can find all of them. Anyways, we are hooking up our cables. This is the cable, uh, the power cable set that goes to the back plane. And this cable goes to the discs. We have fan. Probably, if my fingers can get in there. And then this one goes to the front panel and it controls when the power supply powers up. And then we'll make sure that said fat fingers hasn't disconnected anything else. There we go. And let's see if we get life. Alrighty, so you may recall that uh, I had some problems with Minicom on my laptop a while ago. My VT240s, uh, one has completely died and the other one is on its way out. And I was lamenting the fact that I couldn't work out how to make this go. And it turned out that it may be a Debian thing or it may be a Minicom thing that I'd totally forgotten. They turned hardware flow control on by default and it won't send when there's hardware flow control. So, uh, should anyone be uh, trying this in the future, the um, connection to the PDP requires a null modem, uh, and I've got mine set to 19200 8N1. You can actually dial the board rate in on the back of the board, but for some reason 9600 doesn't work on mine. There we are. 512k of memory, memory test passed. Let's hope our controller is still there. Alright. Now, I've actually, I think I said, powered this up before, and um, I th apparently have shut it down improperly. And so I've managed to piss off the pharmacy software that runs on this. But, oh my. Unable to update this copy of LD Handler. Oh, of course. I have it set to read-only mode. However, uh, this actually brings us to one of the things I was going to talk about, which is um, what operating system it runs. And it says up here, RT11 XM version 504. And this system actually runs RT11 XM, which is the multi-user version, which then chains in RT11 SJ, which is the single job version, and that then executes TSX Plus. And TSX Plus is a complete standalone operating system on its own right, but it doesn't have a boot monitor. I'm sorry, a uh, boot loader. And this means that the system uses RT11 to bootstrap the system, and then you execute TSX Plus like it is an application. And when T6 Plus loads, it then replaces RT11 in memory, and so only T6 Plus remains. Which is kind of complicated, really. But, this is the internal disk. It's a RD51, I believe. RD52A. I think that's a 20 meg disk. And uh, you'll see it has 680 files on it. And that took a hell of a long time to do anything. So, the interesting thing about RT11 and TSX Plus is they have these .sav files, or .save. And uh, the .save files are actually um, a memory image of a running program. And so when you run the .save, it just loads the memory image back in and starts from where it was saved from, which I think is wonderfully clever. Uh, and allowing you to stop a process, save it to disk, and then pick it up later and carry on. Um, which is pretty magical. Now most of these uh, you run it once, you know, and run it again and again and again. You don't usually uh, run it and then stop it and start it and stop it and start it. Um, and I'm not quite sure why they've chosen that manner of storing programs like that, because they do also have regular executables with a, um, a full executable format and a loader and everything like that. 
the um, T6 Plus operating system is very much like RT11 and you will probably notice some pretty serious similarities to DOS. Uh, T6 Plus is a time-sharing version of RT11, or rather it's a time-sharing operating system that looks an awful lot like RT11, presumably to make it easy for people to use. And the um, thing supported multiple terminals and it would time slice jobs across those terminals. Uh, and the later DOSs are, here we go, t6.com, that's what should chain it up, but I think because it's in, um, uh, sing er, I've got the disc on read only right now, it's not starting up. Uh, they say that DOS very heavily copied this format, and it does make sense. Uh, it, it's a nice and easy to use format uh, for entering commands and things like that, and so for something like DOS, um, that kind of flies. List. List. All. Oh. Hmm. It's odd, I thought it was list. Print, maybe? No. Hell, we can't get out. TS Auth is the authorization program for TS8 Plus. Now, I've been flipping through the manuals, but it's kind of hard to pick up an entire OS in the space of three days. Um, but it does have... I'm going to shut this off for the noise. Shut down. Shut down, is that it? Oh, hell with it. Disk in read-only mode. I'm not going to seriously kill it. Probably. Um, it... T6 can come with a um, login authentication program, and the way it works is that each terminal gets its own startup file, and when the startup file is read, you can lock an application to it. And so what you do is you lock the login process, and then the login process calls up the shell. So if you screw up the login, you can't break out of it because... If you use control C in this, it pretty much breaks out down to the shell on damn near anything. Uh, in fact, I had an 1173 that I it had a login, but somebody had failed to um, put it high enough in the boot process so that when it was starting up, even though I didn't know the system password, I did control C and could bypass the login and get to a shell. In the case of this, in theory, you put the login as the first thing in the startup script, and then the login calls another startup script that has all of the things you want to run for the user. The password file for this is, oh, and I've shut it down so I can't show you, is um, probably plain text, but the TS auth program, which is used to maintain that password file, uh, which is a fixed record length file, so you have to say how many users you're going to have, and if you go over that number of users, you have to delete the file and re-enter all of them from scratch. Ah, the things that flew in the old days. But when you run the TS Auth program, you are able to list the users. And, you know, that's no worse than doing a cat slash etc. password or something like that. But with this, it stores the passwords plain text. So if you do a list user, and if somebody who actually remembered what the hell they were doing gave me the right key command for it, it lists all of the users and their passwords and plain text and all of the rights they have. Mmm, security. Well, uh, this is about it. No, wait, there's one more thing, and this is not an excuse, but it's what I've been doing instead of this. So let's go to my shed. That's not a euphemism, by the way. So I made a purchase a few weeks ago, and um, no, it doesn't have a flux capacitor, and nope, I have absolutely no intention of putting one in, but it is mine, and it does run. Well, I am now a proud owner of DeLorean. Uh, this one actually belonged to my wife's grandfather, and it has... I'm not sure if the camera's going to be working in the dark. Man, I can't see squat. Uh, 6,071 actual miles is what the odometer reads. So, uh, I have been working on this because, as anyone who owns one of these will tell you, there are all sorts of good problems that creep up with the low mileage models. Uh, first and foremost is um, the fuel goes stale and then the tank gets all manky. And um, 
what happens is it rots out the inside of the fuel tank. Let me see if I can get a... There it goes. You know, I better have another light around here. Wow, oh, fat lot of good that does. Anyways, uh, and so I spent the first week that I had it with my hands in the fuel tank. Uh, give me a second, I'll pop the hood. I can find the thing, there it goes. And, um... Wander around. Fuel tank lives under the spare seat, and it's just behind this little cover thing here. And it was filled with cack. You know this? I found that in the fuel tank. That's what I emptied out. I mean, a washer and this felt pad of some description. So, it was kind of nasty, but boy, she runs a whole lot better now. The other thing I had to do was the um, gas struts. And there's two on the tailgate, one on each door, and then two on the hood. And they were all shot. Hood wouldn't open until it came back down on your head. Your door did it flip up and then it would come most of the way down to uh, like there-ish. And was really good at clouting you on the back of the scone. And this was a total bitcheroo as well. And what's happened is because people have been fighting with it, I'll get this closed. You can see the thing is up high. It's actually warped the hood because when people were trying to open the damn thing, like I still have to do, I've got to pad the thing out with foam, you um, pull the release mechanism, which is under the steering wheel and then lift up at the same time, and so it's warped this panel. It kind of pisses me off. And um, at some point, somebody blew out the rear window. Because I found all sorts of glass down behind the passenger seat. Yeah, there's a piece there. And they sealed it like crap, so I don't know what kind of monkeys they got to repair this thing before I got it, but for something that's super low mileage, it needs a little bit of help. Anyways, so I'm not really sure this counts uh, because it's certainly not computer wear, but I'm calling it geek wear, damn it all. So that's where my time has been as well. I'm not kidding. I'm not sticking a friggin' flux capacitor in it. Don't ask. I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I'm going to try and get something to you sooner. I think we're going to go back to some regular programming. I'm going to tear something apart. Have a fantastic week. I see the reading. Adios, muchachos.